you can maybe start us off with an opening statement about the wrapping up the Tulsa game and maybe looking ahead to West Virginia, and then we'll go to questions from there. Well, it's just that we, we finished up Tulsa and then uh, obviously now getting into West Virginia and had a good workout last night. Day off today. Okay, with that, we'll open it up to questions. If you have a question for Coach Gundy, please click raise hand. Our first question is going to come from Scott Wright from the Oklahoma. Go ahead, Scott. Scott. Zoom is a tough one. Yeah. Scott, I can see Scott's mouth moving. Scott, I'm here now. I'm here now. Sorry about that. A hey, uh, hey, coach, any uh, any update on uh, on Spencer's injury? We we uh, booted him up. We'll take it off on Tuesday and then put him out there Wednesday and go from there. If uh, if he can't go, is uh, would Shane be your next option? Well, we haven't got that far yet. You know, we've got three guys available, and uh, we'll have to make that decision based on practice reps. Um, good news is we don't have to practice till Tuesday, so um, we'll figure that out on Tuesday afternoon. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from Robert Allen from Triple Play Sports. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, Mike, looking back on it, and you you probably have had a chance to talk a little bit with uh, Shane Illingworth. Uh, give me an idea of what you thought about his demeanor, how he handled being out there for the first time, because I thought he was unusually comfortable for a, for a first-time freshman. Uh, I thought he was uh... – composed and, and uh, executed very well. Um, you know, he's got a good team to handle the situation. Um, I don't know that we could have asked him to do more than what he did, so we were pleased with his play. I thought one of his key plays was his throwaway. A lot of times a kid in that position is just going to be desperate to make something happen. The mindset that, hey, I'm just going to throw the ball away, right. takes a long time to teach kids that sometimes. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's okay to throw it away and play another down, you know, obviously instead of taking a loss or forcing it into coverage. Um, so, for, you know, for the most part, the situation he's in, he played well. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sean Manning from the Dominion Post in West Virginia. Go ahead, Sean. Hey, Mike. Uh, Josh Sills obviously playing his former team this weekend. What were the conversations like with him um, at the beginning stages, and then what has he done to earn that start at left guard? Well, Josh has been really good for us. He's come in and, and competed. Uh, took him quite a while to get back in shape. He was off. Um, then, uh, you know, then we the, the virus hit, and he went back home and I think hunted for three months and then came back and had to get in shape again. Uh, but, but he's been good for us. He likes to play football. He's a good leader. He's a great person. So we're certainly glad that he's on our team. Our next question comes from Barry Trammell from the Oklahoma. Go ahead, Barry. Yeah, Mike, we often talk about how you guys pick quarterbacks. And, um, you know, it can be difficult if, if they haven't played. How difficult is it if you haven't even, like, choosing a backup quarterback? How difficult is it when they, you haven't really even seen them practice all that much? It's extremely difficult. Uh, it's become the hardest part of, of offensive football for the head coach, in my opinion in that they don't get as many reps as they should get. Um, sadly enough, I was thinking about that um, a few months ago, is that there can be co good quarterbacks that really never show up because they don't get enough practice or work with the ones. Um, for example, Joe Burrow. Uh, that can happen at times just based on the way things fall, who the starter should be, who the backup should be. And the toughest part for a quarterback is to be the number two guy in spring practice because it's difficult to work with the twos when the offense is generally a little further ahead than the defense. Do you have, in, in those cases, do you just have to learn about guys when you see them in game action, in other words? I mean, I assume you learned a lot more about Bullock and Illingworth Saturday than you had in whatever, how many months you, you were dealing with them. Well, that's true. Uh, and, I'd say 75% of the time you can tell in practice, but it's not always that way. Sometimes you find out more in a game. Uh, there's, there's so much more to being a quarterback. I mean, you can look good in practice and throw good, and, but you, the savvy, your ability to handle the pressure, composure, um, your willingness to throw a ball away, just different things. A lot of times you can't see that in practice. You only see it in games, and that's what I was referring to, that 
sometimes we don't find out about quarterbacks till it's too late. We, we didn't know what we had in Brandon Whedon until he got in and started playing two or three games. I mean, he looked good in practice and all that. And then there's times he would do things that would make you scratch your head. And then he got in games and we were like, why is this guy not playing earlier? So you find out uh, about quarterbacks sometimes a lot later than, than you should. Our next question comes from Garen Emig from the Tulsa World. Go ahead, Garen. Mike, do you think coaches are on more alert just in general with regard to injuries for their kids just since they were gone out of the program for so long during the off season and, and you didn't have them conditioning optimally like they normally would? Uh, we, we've been concerned from day one. Um, I had Doc Ivan come and talk to the team again last night after practice uh, for a variety of things. We continue to talk about protection from the virus, uh, the different uh, protocol that's been put into place by the Big 12 just last week, uh, all the different areas of concerns. Um, we've gone extensive. We've gone into extensive measures to try to protect the cardio uh, uh, part of, of recovery from the virus. Uh, we were not in very good shape Saturday. Uh, we've had a lot of practices, but they've not been consistent practices with our team like they have been last year. When we went to Oregon State last year, we were running on all cylinders and we were a machine when it came to our cardio. We were pretty average in this last game just because of a variety of reasons. Myself and Coach Glass had great concerns about that, but we also had concerns about pushing guys too much in practice because of what's happened with the virus. All right. Okay, thanks. Our next question comes from Kevin Kinder from the Blue Gold News in West Virginia. Go ahead, Kevin. Coach, last year, um, Oklahoma State had to play West Virginia without Spencer Sanders and Tylen Wallace, and obviously had several guys miss most of all of this game, your last game. Did the confidence of your team overall, some of your backups especially, knowing that, hey, we can come in and perform, and you know their teammates knowing, hey, these guys are ready to play if they need to? I feel good about the confidence in our team. Um, you know, we, we've been very fortunate. We have a lot of depth and maturity on defense. Uh, depending on where we're at with Spencer, as I said, we'll know a lot more Tuesday. We've had guys in his situation with a mild injury come out of the boot and, and do well and play. And then we've had guys that weren't able to play. Um, you know, the old coach is saying that, you know, the next guy's got to step up and play. I mean, that's really what has to happen here. You know, we put another guy in, he gets the reps. What we try to do is make sure that we give the guy reps that's going to play in the game. All coaches do that. Sometimes it's not always easy, but we have to make that determination uh, by Wednesday. Our next question from Jacob Unruh from the Oklahoman. Go ahead, Jacob. Hey, Mike. Um, you mentioned the offensive line was um, musical chairs on Saturday. What, is, what was your evaluation when you look at film and things like that, the offensive line? Uh, we were just below average based on musical chairs. Um, it's extremely difficult. Um, you know, you, you can call it like you want, but when you move people around that much, uh, the continuity is, is difficult. So, you know, hopefully we can get set in what we need and guys can get quality uh, reps this week and have them where we want them based on where we think it gives us the best chance for success. But when you have six different people move in multiple spots in a game, you're not going to have as much continuity and consistency as you want. Um, you know, there's just nothing you can do about it. You just got to try to fit guys in and, and go play and find a way to win the game. Uh, Birmingham got a little banged up. What's his status? Well, we'll find out on him. His was a little more serious. Uh, we'll, we'll know about all of them because they all get put in boots. But, but uh, his was more than, than what the quarterbacks was. You know, the good thing with Zoom, you're in your PJs. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a T-shirt. I'm – <laughs> yeah, I, your Zoom is going pretty far down there. Is it? I doesn't see that on my screen. So uh, I'm just I got you, didn't you? Got nervous, didn't you? Yeah, that's fine. You can look. I don't care. Um, hey, um, off topic a little bit too. The electronic whistles—they seem like they're hard to hear. What? Uh, what do you think of those? Well, I didn't hear you. Do what? The electronic whistles seem like they were kind of hard to hear Saturday. What do you think of those? Are you talking about with the officials? Yeah. I never heard one. Never heard one. And, but you know this, you know they don't blow whistles in the game. You know that. The mm. only time that uh, officials, I didn't realize this till about 12 years ago, the only time officials blow whistles in a game is when they're trying to stop the game, stop the clock, or uh, the end of a quarter, or a timeout or something. But 
just in the flow of a game, which is the majority of the game, they don't ever blow whistles to end a play. And um, I, I never heard one electronic whistle. That seemed problematic. It seemed like some guys almost got some free shots on some quarterbacks and stuff. Hopefully both teams understand, you know, just like when to stop and when not to stop. Um, but I actually, I forgot they had electronic whistles until you brought it up. I never heard a whistle. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Our next question comes from Frank Bonner from the Tulsa World. Go ahead, Frank. Hey, Mike, you talked about the conditioning with your players and not wanting to push them too hard in practice. Now the season has started, how do you find that balance of, of pushing them to their threshold but still trying to keep them fresh? We're going to have to push them. We had that discussion yesterday, obviously, myself and Coach Glass. Um, we have to push them now. Um, we're healthy. We've had discussions with our medical team. We had discussions with Doc Ivan, our team physician, about where we're at. We feel good about the cardio and the health of the guys that are on our football team because we've been very fortunate with the virus. So we have to begin to push them now. We've got to get in better shape. So to answer your question is we'll push them now more than we have the last three weeks. How long do you think it'll take to get them in the, in the, the usual shape you're expected? Gosh, we were probably at 75% Saturday. Hopefully we could be at 85% and then maybe the next week 95 or better. You tightened your screen up when I mentioned his PJs, didn't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you tightened up, Frank. I see you, buddy. A little bit, a little bit. I appreciate yeah, you it, Mike. Yeah, you up on your face because you weren't sure if I could see your PJs. Well, I, I've got on sweats. I got you. <laughs> no, hopefully in, in a couple weeks we'll get a little better. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jenny Carlson from the Oklahoma. Go ahead, Jenny. Mike, I'm still mad last week. I did my makeup and actually got in real clothes, and you weren't even on video last week. Well, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I am not a big Zoom guy. These Zooms drive me crazy. It's like game day. They had me trying to listen to a speaker when the, the young lady was talking to me. I couldn't hear her. I couldn't hear anything. It was a mess, but it is what it is. So. Well, hey, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Thurman being recognized on Saturday in the Ring of Honor. Um, you were obviously came – a little bit behind him. He was already on campus by the time you uh, became a player. What do you remember of him uh, early, like maybe when you were on recruiting visits or, or even as a, as a high school spectator of, of OSU football? What do you remember of Thurman? The thing I remember most about him was, and I've said this a lot, was his willingness to practice. I mean, he was the best practice player. Him and Sanders or well, you know, really all these guys, Blackman, Hartley Dyke, Sanders, all those guys were tremendous practice practice players. Thurman practiced full speed every day. Blocking drills, running, it didn't make any difference. And, and then in games, when he was in pass protection, he would step up and hit a defensive end or a linebacker right square in the mouth. And he was aggressive uh, and he wasn't scared. And I remember him more for that than I even do his ability to run the football. And that's why he was so successful in the NFL. You know, he was in that uh, fast break offense there with Buffalo with uh, uh, Jim Kelly in the game because he was a, a tremendous pass protector and a good receiver. And um, then obviously he could rush when he needed to, but his ability to practice extremely hard and lead the way was what I remember as him as a player. What do you feel like? I mean, he obviously, he, I think he talked about the fact like when he came on his visit, like Hernan Stanerson was one of his uh, hosts or whatever. So, I mean, like the, the track record of running backs existed before he arrived, but what do you feel like his legacy has been uh, to the program now all these years later? Well, he's obviously an NFL Hall of Famer. There's only so many of those guys walking around. Um, you know, he, he tears his knee up in the spring um, and before the season uh, playing basketball and then um, comes back with a brace and plays on it uh, and continues to practice hard. Uh, and I, I go back to if, if today's, if the young people that played the game today understood watching him practice, um, they would be much different in their approach to the game. He never protected himself at all in practice. He went 100% all the time. And that's really what his legacy is around here. And then obviously he's an NFL Hall of Famer. Thanks. Yeah. Our next question comes from Chris Becker from the Oak Holly. Go ahead, Chris. Coach, good morning. Good morning. You talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, how important is this week of preparation for the offensive line after those injuries occurred? Well, it, it's important for everybody. We, we didn't play very good. And, 
we, we need to improve. Hopefully we can improve much more in the second game than, uh, than where we were at in the first game. Um, we played average at best and, and honestly probably below average, okay? So we have to be <clears throat> smart with, with our schemes and concepts. We've got to get guys in the right spot before we start practice on Tuesday. Can't play musical chairs and we, hopefully we can keep them healthy and play. But uh, Tuesday and Wednesday's practice is very important. We got to get a lot of reps because we got some new guys in there. You know, how, how much does having a coach like Charlie Dickey help with that, getting the offensive line ready? Well, he's, he's a very good football coach. He's a great person. He's a good motivator. And he's got the most difficult job. Um, he, he's coaching five guys that, uh, that in most cases play every play of the game on offense. Everybody else other than the quarterback rotates. So they get tired. They're 300 pounds. Um, they've got to see multiple looks. They've got to use a lot of strength and energy on every play. So he has a difficult job. Being an offensive line coach is extremely difficult, but he's experienced. He's a very good technician. He's a good person, and he's a good motivator. Thank you, Coach. All right, down to our last couple questions for Coach Gundy. Our next question is going to come from Barry Trammell from the Oklahoma. Go ahead, Barry. Yeah, uh, Mike, just as an aside, nobody's even asked you about the defense. The defense won you the game. Does it give you a – does it give you a sense of relief that the hype and expectations of this defense, they lived up to it on Saturday? Uh, to be honest with you, as the game got going on in the latter part of the second quarter and the third, I was trying to think of the last time or one of the last few times that we'd gone without scoring a touchdown was crossing my mind. Uh, and then I also was thinking how nice it was that I felt very comfortable in the game because we were stopping them. And – you know, everybody that's on this Zoom call knows in Big 12 play, that's not what's happened over the last 10 years. Everybody's held their breath to see who gets the ball last, so whoever gets the ball last scores and the game's over. But I felt more comfortable in this game than I have in a number of years because I felt like that we were stoning them on defense, and I figured at some point somebody's got to score. Hopefully it's just us. Um, so what you're saying is correct, and – there's not many years that, in many games that I've had that feeling that we could just hold on and sputter around on offense like we did. Who in particular stood out to you defensively? Gosh, Malcolm Rodriguez was good. Calvin Bundage was good. Um, Trey Sterling was good. Um, uh, Trace Ford was active. Um, Christian played well. Rodarius played well. Um, there was just a number. Amon played well. I mean, we had a number of guys that were really active. And I, and I had a talk with them last night after practice that I, I just appreciated their effort and their willingness to continue to go on the field and, and stop them when it, when it didn't look like we could score any points on offense. But also reminded them, hey, we've been on the flip side of this. I mean, there's times the offense just kept scoring, and we wondered if we ever going to stop anybody on defense. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it is sometimes. But – the, if they continue to run around and play with effort like they did, we'll have a chance in the games that we play just based on their ability to slow people down and run and make tackles. Our final question is going to come from Jared Alatore from the Ocali. Go ahead, Jared. Good morning, Coach. Good morning. Uh, did the emergence of L.D. Brown keep Chuba fresh and strengthen the running back position with more opportunities for L.D. in the future, do you think? He was awesome. LD was played his best game in all areas. In pass protection, he stepped up and hit people in the face. When he had the chance to rush the football, he ran extremely hard, and he did a really good job with ball, uh, ball security. And, and I told him that. I was thrilled with him. Um, he played better and more aggressive and had more fun in that game than he had in his career here. And his creases will be, getting, will be increased with that. You run hard, you take care of the football, and you're willing to pass protect and play hard like he does, you're going to get to play in a lot of plays. So that's what he was told after the game, and we're expecting him to play more in the next game. Thank you. All right, Coach, I'll do it for questions. But if you'd like to, if you want to maybe just put a bow on this whole thing, any kind of closing remarks, anything that stood out to you or anything that you want to address specifically? No, I'm good. It's, it's, uh, it was good to get back on the field and play. Uh, you know, I thought that the fans were awesome. You know, I, uh, I wish the president would let another 10,000 in. But uh, uh, I actually thought that there was times it was loud out there, and I expected it to be a little more quiet. Um, but I thought that there was good sound, and, and the players are excited, and hopefully we can keep everybody healthy and continue to play football. 
Well, Coach, thank you so much for your time this morning. We always appreciate you. All right. We'll see you guys. See you next time.